Testing, one, two, three, four. Dear Anne Farabee, in answer to your letter of September 26th to Rosemary Rabin of the Victor Gruen Foundation, let me say that we did take Mr. Bradley's talk, and it is unedited. However, I also think it's incomplete. The first few words, uh, or perhaps the first sentence, are not on the tape, so that when I stop speaking and the mayor starts speaking, uh, it'll seem that he's coming in in the middle of a sentence, and I have to apologize for this, but the college student that we had taping it just didn't seem to uh, get the machine turned on in time. Anyway, uh, we're happy to, to send it to you, and we hope there's something there that you can use. And in the meanwhile, if there's anything else we can do for you, please don't hesitate to call me Tracy Sussman.
These controls have largely been the kind of zoning regulations, building codes, and similar kinds of regulations, which are essentially negatives. They are thou shalt not. And they have little to do with any kind of positive recognition of affirmative use and planning of our land resources. The utility of this traditional concept of land must be questioned in light of the severe pressures now being placed upon it by the continued population growth, by increasing urban and industrial development, by expanding transportation systems, and in some cases by the hope for expansion of transportation systems, by the fragmentation of governmental entities exercising land use powers, and the increased size and scale and the impact of private action. The growing number of public officials and private citizens like yourselves, upon feeling and perceiving the impact of these pressures, are speaking now of the land use crisis. This is the crisis that threatens orderly economic development and the quality of our environment. To meet this emerging crisis, the, the traditional concept of land and land use control must be divided, revised and made responsive to the changing times and circumstances. There's one overriding desire, and that is the desire of people to have some kind of involvement, some kind of voice in these kinds of decisions. We in Los Angeles started what was called the Goals Concept, and the whole purpose was to fully involve the public, to get from them what they thought ought to be done with regard to planning in Los Angeles. And the concept was so new that people simply didn't believe, and they didn't come as we had anticipated. Uh, we were able to get only a very small turnout at each of these public meetings that were held, and we had to revise that uh, approach somewhat in order to get a better balance and a, a better kind of citizen input. This is the kind of thing that I think we must encourage. I'm pleased to say that the result of some actions over the last couple of years now clearly indicate to me that the public finally is becoming aware of the threat to our future. The enactment of the coastline protection measure is just one example. The pressure upon our legislators at every level it's another evidence of that kind of concern by the public. You and I know that public officials can and do respond to pressure. And it is your pressure which has brought about the change in attitude and philosophy in the halls of government all over the country. And it is that continuing pressure that's going to bring about the changes that you and I think are necessary. We talk about a matter of a uh, prescription for Los Angeles. Well, I don't suppose that it is unique to Los Angeles. And, uh, I want to talk about three or four things I think we've got to to take a look at. You know, it may be necessary that we implement some kind of adequate public facilities ordinance. This kind of ordinance would uh, forbid the development of, unless there was adequate fire, police, sewer, and other needed services. We've seen over and over again now that simply building new developments, indicating to the people that the services are somehow going to be provided, they're going to get nice, decent, sanitary, and safe, and beautiful housing, and that they're not going to have to pay for them. The fact of the matter is that when that happens, and this is a development just on the edge of the older part of the city, you know who's paid for it, all the people pay for it. The expansion of the public facilities are then going to be necessary in order to provide the adequate services to this new community. So the older community pays just as well as the new ones. And that inequity simply has to stop. 
It is necessary, in my judgment, to redirect the development towards the populated areas of our communities, and thus to take advantage of the infrastructure, the streets and the highways and the electrical utilities and all the other things that are already in place. We can no longer afford to simply abandon major sections of our city. Some are hope that we'll build new ones and forget that uh, area of the city that has now become blighted and deteriorated because of age and, and overuse. Those facilities remain. We've got to begin to revitalize those sections of the city. We've got to begin to return people to those areas. We've got to begin to redevelop them in a way that they will be attractive for all people who want to live there. We need to revitalize and to re-stimulate the economy in some of the poorer sections of our city and other cities as well. That, again, is a part of the planning process. How do you get the jobs close to where people live? How do you avoid that long two-hour trip every day to and from work? I was in New York just a couple of weeks ago. I talked to the man who said he traveled from his home to work every day by helicopter. Not San Yoris. <laughs> <laughs> this was a man, a banker in New York City. And it cost him $100 a week just in transportation on that helicopter. Now that had become a way of life for him. Now that's an overstatement of the the nature of the problem. But it is not unique to New York. Nor is it unique to people here in the Los Angeles community. Over and over again, people are faced with this problem getting to and from their home and their work at the places of recreation and entertainment. We in our planning process simply have to find a way to bring those two elements closer together. The nature of our transportation problems alone would clearly indicate that that's going to be necessary. Streets are already congested, and it's going to get worse. The Environmental Protection Agency has already given us some mandates that we have to reduce our driving. As a matter of fact, they've said we've got to stop building public parking lots, and they want us to reduce the older ones by 20% per year. Uh, you're going to complain about having to pay a dollar and a half or maybe and a half park here. What would you think if you came and you found no place to park? That's the nature of the problem that is creeping up on us. That's why some of these new and dramatic steps are going to have to be taken. We've got to begin to look at the whole process of how we value land, how we regard it, how we treat it, how we tax it. Should we continue to permit certain special interest communities to escape their burden of the taxes, carry the load for services all over a region, a county, or even a city. Can we permit them to continue to set up special cities as we have in the Los Angeles County area, where they don't have to provide services for people, they provide services only for buildings, for industry, and thus have their taxes reduced, thus depleting the commerce and the industrial development in the other older sections of the region. That's what has been happening because of our lack of awareness of what we've got to do about the assessment of land. Drew and I again were talking just a little bit ago and we talked about this concept. How do you equalize the value of land? When you build a rapid transit program even when you build a freeway system. You and I know that the land values along those routes, and especially at the nodes where there's going to be a transit stop, those land values increase tremendously. Who takes advantage of it? The speculator or that landlord. Who suffers? Those who have land elsewhere are going to have to carry an additional burden because of the depletion of the level of tax base in that community. Why shouldn't we expect that when we build a public facility like a transit system, that the people who are going to be benefited there, who are going to have their land values increased, 
should somehow return part or perhaps all of that increase in value to the total public sector. Now, this is the kind of equalization that I think brings some sanity to this business of land ownership. You wouldn't have to worry about whether you are going to have your land value increased or decreased. Because while there are some who benefit, there are also some who suffer when those values change. One of these days, I think that we in this country are going to begin to move toward the concept that uh, the tax increment is a way of balancing the equities. When we increase the value of some land because of the construction of public facilities, that the public should be the one to benefit, not that individual owner who happens to be there. Now that can be done with regard to transportation. I suppose that may be our first step. But ultimately, I think we're going to have to take a look at that process as it deals with all land use. The actions which are taken at the local level must somehow be related to the region, to the state, and to a national kind of reform. I'm pleased that we, in long last, have a bill now in the uh, National Congress dealing with the whole question of land use, planning, and growth policy. It's going to give considerable flexibility to the states, so new uh, and, and uh, I think very creative opportunities for the states to get involved in this whole question. But we cannot do it at the national or the state level alone. We're going to have to bring it down to the region and to the local communities. And that's where the best in our talent and resources will be required. So that it is something that makes sense, that it fits in a rational way with what is being done, not only in our community, not only in the state, but nationally. I do believe that we as regional citizens must begin to design a governmental structure that will effectively balance the ever increasing demands upon the land, a structure that will relate to the environmental and land use control and to the economic and social needs of our community. A structure that seeks solutions and resolutions that will help us to achieve the quality of the environment and economic stability and vitality and the kind of social justice that this great nation deserves. I do have a sense of hope for Los Angeles. We've been largely an unplanned community, but there is hope because we're still young and we're an unfinished community. The challenge of planning, the challenge of a better design for tomorrow, is the kind of challenge that stimulates all of us. Some say that it's an awesome challenge. I look upon it equally as an opportunity. I welcome that opportunity be involved in the process that will in fact bring Los Angeles from the point where it is simply a sleepy village or a vast community of some 67 communities to the point where it will truly be the jewel of the Pacific Coast Basin. Thank you very much.
essentially, this regulation, this legislation, simply giving to the states certain rights to establish in their own areas the kind of land use controls and the kind of direction that will permit us to do some of the things that we think ought to be done. So I'm hopeful that we can get it through the Congress. My next concern would then be what kind of a bill, what kind of regulations, what kind of actions are going to be taken by the state of California. That leads right into the next question. Should the city of Los Angeles establish an official growth policy? And if so, should it be a regional effort to regulate absolute growth? Are there national carrying capacities restrictions in Los Angeles that should control the rate timing and location of growth. Absolutely. You thought of all of those things in the short period of time I was speaking. <laughs> <laughs> the answer to the first question, should Los Angeles establish an official growth policy? And I say the answer is yes, I think we should. We are now zoned for 10 million people. That's unthinkable. We simply are going to have to begin, and soon, to devise some kind of a growth policy. I recommended that three years ago. Planning Commission and the staff has acted upon it. That matter is now before the City Council's Planning Committee. I hope that uh, enough public pressure will be brought to bear that a rational and reasonable measure can come out of the Council and will then be signed into law. I'm going to do everything I can to see that it comes about. This is one about rapid transit. Why must rapid transit be jammed down the throats of all the people in the county when it will only serve the commercial interests of downtown land developers of central Los Angeles? Well, I think that's assuming a fact, not an evidence. The 116-mile system that has been talked about by the consultants to the rapid transit district would cover a vast area. I'm sure that there are principally six major corridors. But as I see a transportation system, not just a rapid transit system, uh, the, the whole system must fit a flexible transportation service to the immediate community that fits into the corridor where the rapid transit lines are going to run. That will permit you to travel anywhere in the Los Angeles County area, and ultimately you may be aware of the fact that this is intended to be expanded to cover areas beyond the county of Los Angeles. I suppose your concern is that it doesn't run by or block uh, my home, and therefore I can't just walk out and get on it very conveniently. You may have to take a bus or a minibus or a jitney or something else to get to the corridor. But if, if our dreams come true, I think that the system is going to serve the entire region and serve it very well. And if it's going to serve the region well, you know, we absolutely have to have it. That's the, the first of the uh, consideration. We've got to have it. And if it's going to serve, and we believe that it will, I think that everybody not only is entitled, but I think mean, ought to welcome the opportunity to help build it so that uh, the congestion, the burden upon them will be relieved, even if they never have to ride it. In 1968, you said you'd take on Detroit if they didn't produce clean cars. Are you willing to take on the oil companies now that gas rationing is the only way to get clean air within the immediate future? Well, I think that you, you're sticking the wrong picture. You know, you talk about gas rations, you're really talking about impacting the one of the people who live here who are stuck to their automobiles because there is no other transportation system. So I don't think that the gas rationing is the answer. I think there are many other steps that can be taken and ought to be taken to provide an adequate transportation system. The Los Angeles area and do not uh, hit the automobile driver as the culprit in this matter. I think it is possible to do more to clean up the gasoline. Certainly, there is more that has to be done to clean up those automobiles. I'd like to point the finger at the real uh, the problems in this matter. Let's not to lose sight of the fact that it's not the person who drives an automobile who ought to be blamed. 
Should environmental impact reports address the problem of land use capability? Yes. <laughs> During the campaign, you once proposed creation of a land ombudsman position in Los Angeles city government to clarify such conflicts with the land transactions as the Occidental Oil Pacific Palisade swap. You intend to create such a position. We are going to have in the, in the office of the mayor a staff people who will be assigned to a number of what you might call ombudsman activity, field of education, field of planning, and a variety of other things, so that we may not call it an ombudsman, but the effect will be the same because that person will be there working in the interest of the public, serving as an advocate for Prodding, pressuring, examining what's going on, trying to bring about a more responsive government and a government that is designed to protect and serve the interests of all of the people, not just special interests. As long as property taxes penalize redevelopment of land on a private basis, what chance is there of encouraging recycling of the old area? Do you see that as a worthwhile goal? Not only is it a worthwhile goal, I think that it is absolutely essential, and I referred to it in part in my remarks earlier. I understand that's not going to be an easy matter, because you can't simply uh, go in and put in one new facility or one new home in a block uh, when all of the rest of the ground is a shambles. But I believe that we are going to have to attack this problem, and on a rather large basis if we're going to have any hope for revitalizing some of the major sections of our city. We are now taking a look at a plan called Central Cities Plan. It takes a look at the area just to the east of the city center, east of Main Street. That's one step, but it's an example of what must be done section after section in the city. And it is my hope that we can lay the groundwork for it. We may not see it come to pass. Either in my administration, certainly, nor uh, uh, perhaps in the next 10, maybe 20 years. But unless we begin now that planning process, that direction for this goal, uh, we'll never reach it. I believe that we'll uh, take significant steps along the way during the course of my term in office. Thank you very much for the chance to come and chat with you this morning. Thank you very much.